and this is where I'll start recording. Um, this week we've got a review of 5.2, including the question set, a little bit about the question set. And then we're gonna spend uh, most of our time today talking about King Corn so that we can, um, and, and I, I would like everyone participating in that, but uh, so that we can get a good idea of what the implications of King Corn really are. So let's start with that review of 5.2. And we'll start with a brief overview of the lecture notes. Um, there are a few things that I want to make sure that we're, we're clear about. Um, one of them is pest control. So what are some ways to accomplish pest control? What are ways that pest control is done? Yep, make sure that you're on these notes or that you're on your own notes. And I'm really looking for your participation because, you know, Mr. Tout and I can talk all day about this stuff. We already have. But this is the part that we want to make sure that you guys understand. So what are some ways that farmers do pest control? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough morning. Hey, thank you. Yeah, pesticides. Oh, no problem. We're, this is not spelling class, so I don't think either of us are concerned about that part. We just want to make sure that you're, <laughs> we just want to make sure you're participating. That's the most important thing right now. Okay, so thank you, Dade. Um, yeah, so pest control is often done through pesticides. Pest control is often done through manual control meaning physically picking pests or removing them. Um, there are other biological methods of pest control. So sometimes you can get like ladybugs that'll eat aphids. Aphids can destroy 
um, all sorts of green leafy things. Um, you can also, also gardeners like to get praying mantises to help them eat all sorts of smaller bugs in their garden. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do pest control. Sometimes pest control, sometimes pest control is done chemically. Sometimes it's done manually and sometimes it's done biologically. Okay. Um, there are also lots of different kinds of pollinators. What is a well-known pollinator? What is something that helps to pollinate plants? Mr. Tout's giving you a huge hint. Bees! Thank you. Yes, bees. And the, that, bees are responsible for pollinating something around like a third of our crops. Um, there are some plants that are self-pollinating. So they're, they're capable of doing it all by themselves. Um, a lot of plants are pollinated by the rain, by the wind, and general, generally by physical conditions. Um, there are other pollinators, there are other insects that help. There are mammals that sometimes do pollination. Um, but for the most part, these are the, the major three for pollinators. Uh, the last part that I wanted to talk about in terms of sustainability was antibiotics. So this gets a lot of attention in the media, the use of antibiotics and hormones. Um, antibiotics are used, as we saw in king corn, for what reason? Why, why would we use antibiotics in the context of food production? So Mr. Tao gave you cows, so. What about them? Come on, people. Why, why would cows need antibiotics? Why do we need antibiotics? Grow as big as possible without feeling the pain. Feeling the pain of what? I mean, that's yes. Yeah. I agree. We're halfway there. Cows need massive doses of antibiotics in order to fight off what?
All right. Well, I'll 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 end the pain here. Uh, Cows need massive doses of antibiotics in order to fight off infections, right? Bacterial infections. I know you know that. I know you knew that, but just got to speak up. So um, that's why we have massive doses of antibiotics is in order to fight off infections in our own bodies. And the reason the cows need them is that they are in in, in most livestock operations. Um, they're called CAFOs, which oh. stands for Confined Animal Feeding Operations, I believe. Um, they're in close quarters. And because they're close, then disease spreads quickly. And there's um, a lot of bacteria in their poop, and it's easy for their poop to end up back in their mouth. Um, and also, they are fed a high corn diet, as we saw in king corn. Because they're fed a high corn diet, what happens is there's a lot of sugar in there. And because there's a lot of simple sugars, a lot of simple carbohydrates, uh, then bacteria are easily able to reproduce in that sort of environment. It's not healthy. It doesn't provide them with the, the normal nutrients. It makes them fat, but it also leaves them susceptible to infection. So they're given lots of antibiotics. When you eat beef or anything else that has been exposed to those antibiotics, in a lot of cases, um, those, those antibiotics either uh, pass through to you in some cases, but more likely than not, the antibiotic resistant bacteria uh, in a lot of cases are still present in that meat. And that's where we get these bacterial outbreaks that are particularly dangerous to humans because they are resistant to most antibiotics that we use. I'm so, going to, go ahead. I'm going to resist asking this as a question because it feels like we're all kind of just slowly warming up to class today. So I'm just going to say it as opposed to asking the question. But keep in mind, right, that those antibiotics uh, wouldn't work for COVID-19 because COVID-19 is a virus, right? And viruses and bacteria are sort of the two main things we think of as germs, right? The word we use for germs are like something that causes a disease. But point being, um, those antibiotics will help fight off bacteria. However, and Mr. Dutton brought this up, this is, uh, evolution is constantly occurring, right? And so we are driving evolution of bacteria by feeding massive lots of cows bacteria all the time. And we're literally evolving bacteria to be bacteria, to be antibiotic resistant. So, it's a problem. It's, it's, it's a huge problem. And antibiotic resistance is one of those <laughs> that uh, is, one of, is, is a major uh, is a major point of research for scientists who are afraid that that could be um, the next sort of epidemic. If, uh, yeah, and if I may, let me just see if I can find the quote. Give me a second. I know it's in here. Where did I hide that quote? So um, sustainability, guys, uh, was defined uh, in, back in 1987 uh, by is it Humboldt. I can't remember her name, but a person who led uh, the World Commission on Environmental and the Environment and Development. Sustainability is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So if we're if, if what we're doing right now is producing antibiotic resistant bacteria, we're sort of, that, that is by its very definition, like uh, directly hindering future generations ability <laughs> to protect themselves and their own cattle. Yep. So speaking of sustainability, there are inequalities in food production and distribution. Remember, something we emphasized is that our current food issue 
is not a problem of production. It's a problem of distribution. And that has been made incredibly apparent by all of the pictures and the video coming out from all of these farms where food is just being wasted. Food is not, food is just rotting out in the fields. Uh, milk is being thrown down the drain because it cannot be distributed to where it is needed right now uh, due to the effects of COVID-19. Um, and that is just a magnification of the problems that have already existed in the world where we do not have a problem with producing food. We have a problem with getting the food to the people who need it the most. Um, Food waste is present in both LEDCs and MEDCs, but for different reasons, and that has to do with this production distribution issue. Um, there are a lot of reasons that societies choose particular food production systems. Um, that's what this point is all about. Um, socioeconomics has to do with, you know, why people are poor, why so other people are rich, and what that has to do with society, what that has to do with um, the, the issues within a particular society, an American society, your skin color is unfortunately a predictor of your socioeconomic status. Uh, it is not hard and fast, but uh, that is something that plays a huge role in American society, whereas it doesn't necessarily do so in other, um, in other societies. Um, we see here about uh, the availability of land for food production. Um, as, as we urbanize and we degrade our soil, we have less land available for food production. And I, and I think that's one of those things that's just obvious when you think about it, um, but it's important to point out. Um, I agree, Lena, and I think that unfortunately, uh, that discussion is uh, just outside the scope of what we're talking about, but I agree with you, okay. Um, the yield of food per unit area from lower trophic levels is greater in quantity, meaning that we can get a lot, a lot, a lot of corn in one acre of land, but you can't get a lot of beef out of one acre of land. And it doesn't really make sense on, on the surface to, be, to talk about, you know, how many cows can we get per acre? But when you think about it, that cow has to eat. So how many acres of, of food does that cow need in order to be delivered uh, from being born to your dinner plate? Um, so, so the real question here is this, this yield of food per unit area is, is better on lower parts of the food chain. So your producers, and then your primary consumers are better than your secondary consumers. Because if you eat secondary consumers, then you're eating the things that are eating the things. Um, so it's better to just eat the plants directly rather than to eat the things that are eating the plants or to eat the things that are eating the things that are eating the plants. Of course, we have cultural choices all along the way. Okay? If we said tomorrow, if we said tomorrow, all right, everyone's going to go vegan. Mm -hmm. Um, there would be riots in the streets, literally. Um, we see the pushback on the meat packing plants that are currently, uh, the, the people who are going to the meat pack packing plants and feel free to chime in at any time. I'm just talking so that we continue the discussion. <laughs> um, but the, the reason that the meat packing plants are being um, are, are, are being staffed right now, despite the fact that they work in close conditions, they work in dangerous conditions, uh, they're not getting hazard pay. And it's, there are a few instances of, of so, and you're probably going here, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, go there's, ahead. There's, there's a few instances of meatpacking plants where there's been huge coronavirus outbreaks, like hundreds of workers getting sick. So um, they are very much putting their lives on the line we as a culture, we as a society have determined that meat is so important that it is worth people risking their lives. Um, so so that is 
that is a cultural choice that we as a society, we as a culture have made. Um, the, the last thing here is uh, really a good umbrella section here, how we increase sustainability. Obviously, altering human activity to reduce meat consumption and increase consumption of organically and locally uh, produced food, like eating your local corn, right? Grow your corn in your backyard. Uh, grow things locally. Uh, you know a farmer, get your food from the farmer. It's actually better to get the, the cow down the, down the street than it is the corn from halfway across the world. All right, so local is important. Um, organically grown, meaning uh, reduce the use to pesticides, reduce the use of um, herbicides, reduce the use of hormones, reduce the use of antibiotics. All those things that we were just talking about. So that's why this is an umbrella section. Right? And there are a few other things here that are well explained um, just in the notes themselves. Any questions? I want to go to the question set real quick and then to the uh, King Corn discussion. All right. So a few notes on these questions for the question set. Number one, discuss the relationship between the economic development of countries and the sustainability of their food production. So economic development, we're talking about MEDCs and LEDCs. This is worth four marks. So two of those marks should be talking about MEDCs. Two of those marks should be talking about LEDCs. Within each economically developed area, MEDC, LEDC, you should talk about how sustainable their food production is. So, so food production is sustainable when, as Mr. Tout just said, when it's something that future generations can also do. Okay, so talking about how, I, I would get those two marks through talking about how an MEDC can have uh, sustainable food production and how it can be unsustainable. Same thing with LEDCs. How is it that it's sustainable, their food production, and how is it that it can be unsustainable? Um, outline the environmental impact of two named food production systems. So what is one, let's name some food production systems. This is a very high level question. All right, this doesn't mean, you know, uh, farmers, Farmer Joe's uh, sausage making plant, all right? It's not that specific. What is a general food production system? What is one way that we make food? Okay, cows, so livestock. Good. Livestock production, that is a named production system. Okay, what is another food production system? Excellent. Harvesting crops, so farming. And Ken, uh, just to push you a little bit further, guys, um, 
we've talked about several types of farming way back at the beginning of this chapter, right? If you were going to divide, we, we divided it into three different types of, of farming, but if you were going to just divide harvesting crops into two types of harvesting crops, what do you think, where do you think we, we're going with this? Where's my mind going? Basically, can we come up with some other words for going big and going small? as those terms might apply to farming. Sigh. This is pretty intense. This is pretty. Okay. Yeah, that, that would work. Yeah. I like it, Leah. So subsistence and commercial, um, those are even like the next step. Um, so commercial, Right, the word I was thinking was industrial, but commercial is even better. The idea of you're trying to grow food to sell it, right? Uh, and the word Mr. Dutton was trying to remind you guys of is we oftentimes talk about that as intensive, right? So industrial agriculture is intensive and is almost all, well, it's pretty much always commercial with the point of being to sell it, right? Subsistence is growing for yourself. And we typically, uh, if I can throw out two more words, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna do it. Two more words, right? Uh, subsistence agriculture, where we're just doing it just to, just to feed ourselves, right? Just to, just to exist, uh, is almost, you almost always do polycultures, right? Everyone loves to debate, if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be, right? But no one would actually choose that, right? You're not gonna just say, you know what I'm gonna do for my, you know, for the next year, I'm just going to grow corn and just eat corn, right? You wouldn't do that to yourself. So if you're subsistence farming, you're going to do a polyculture, right? Um, commercial farming is almost always a monoculture. They're just growing one crop. Um, or maybe I shouldn't say almost always, but uh, over large tracts of land, they are growing one crop. Awesome. And pastoral, yeah. Yes, and the third type, I did say there were three types. Excellent, yep. yeah. The third type is pastoral, which, uh, is that only livestock or is that mixed livestock with? Livestock. Just livestock, okay. Awesome, thank you. So then number three, the lack of food and fresh water may limit the rate of global population growth beyond 2050. Two reasons that may cause the food supply to be limiting. Um, I, I think th this one, the answer is mostly in the question itself. Uh, like the lack of fresh water may limit the l rate of population growth. Fresh water, food supply, fresh water, food supply. Like there's, there's one that's right there and don't overthink this kind of question. The last question has to do with figure nine. And so it's asking you to compare and contrast these types of shrimp farming. All right. Uh, and specifically through the lens of water quality, how it would affect water quality. So um, make sure that you're paying um, close attention to the uh, organic or chemical fertilizer part. All right. So let's take the last uh, chunk of class here. 
and uh, talk about King Corn. And so let's start at the end because I think these are the most interesting questions um, and we'll see how far backwards we can make it. Having watched King Corn, and I would like everyone to participate, whether that means that you unmute yourself or that you type something privately or type something to the whole class. Uh, do you think you will change anything about the way you eat having watched King Corn? Are you all gonna run out and grab a burger? All right. So thank you, Leah, uh, and thank you, those of you who are responding to me privately. Um, trying to eat foods less corn syrup, corn starch. Good. Um, and then someone said they won't change anything about the way they eat. Um, they'll be more cautious, but not, not necessarily changing the actual foods. Um, maybe, maybe changing, I would imagine, uh, maybe like what brand or what's in the particular food. Maybe you still eat the burger, but the burger is coming from a grass-fed source versus a corn-fed source. So I want to point out, guys, this question, right, is, a, is, is structured initially as a yes or no question, but I think the why or why not is implied. So please, like if you said no, that's totally fine, but why aren't you gonna change, right? And there are reasons why you may not change, right? Um, I certainly did not cook for myself at all until I went to college. So for me, you know, I, I probably would have watched a video like this and be like, wow, that's crazy, but I probably wouldn't have changed my habits much as a 16, 17 year old because I wasn't grocery shopping, I wasn't cooking for myself, and then, you know, I was, certainly raised in a family where you ate what was put in front of you. I did not have, there was no choice about that. So, uh, but you know, you can say that and you still could reflect on what you might change when you have more agency in what you eat. Yeah, I know I stopped eating beef uh, when I was a junior in high school. So uh, and that was mostly because my friend was smoking and I was like, tell you what, if you quit smoking, I'll quit eating beef. Both of us had been thinking about both of those things. And so it worked out to both our benefits until I learned that uh, he was smoking behind my back so that he could still um, get me to stop eating beef. And I didn't go back to eating beef. So, you know, it, it, it worked for, for both of us, I guess. He still smokes to this day. Um, but, the, but yeah, I mean, sometimes it involves, if you want to make that change, sometimes it involves having an accountability uh, partner. Yeah, never mind for my friend, right? Um, but he ended up going into the food service industry, and, and in the food service industry, a lot of people just smoke because they, you know, they have five minutes to themselves, and that's it. Uh, not an excuse. No, if but I will if I... Cook, don't smoke. Yeah, I will. I, yeah, I want to reiterate exactly what Mr. Dutton just said. Uh, keep in mind, guys, that uh, this is, it's, uh, you're, you are making decisions right now with your life and, and, and uh, your actions that uh, as you get older, right, as you grow into adulthood and go through adulthood, you're going to have to either decide to keep or change. 
And I can tell you that the longer you wait, the harder change is, right? So if you have sort of this idea of like, oh yeah, I'm going to smoke for now and then I'll, I'll quit smoking later when, you know, when I don't feel like, it, you know, it's a big deal anymore to try to smoke with my friends. At that point, it's really, really difficult. And I have several friends who, you know, who smoke to this day, who I remember in college were saying, oh yeah, I'm just, you know, we're doing it now because it's, I want to look cool or I'm trying to get, you know, this girl or this guy or whatever, but um, it's, it's not as simple once you form a habit, right? It's, it's very difficult to change habits. So do think about like, if you're, if you're doing something now that you think would be silly to continue, you may want to just consider taking your own advice right now. And for instance, baking, are you baking? Not baking, but are you, uh, are those no fry fries? No oil? You're, you're muted, Leah. Sorry, Leah, yeah. Not, not on Zoom, but on your device. <laughs> those look very tasty and healthy. So speaking of tasty, healthy, or otherwise inspiring, number 10, did anything in this film surprise you? Did anything disturb you? Did anything inspire you? I know I was surprised at the end when they bought the acre just so that they could keep it as grass so they could not plant it as corn. Yeah, that was cool. And, and surprising, yes. How unhealthy, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they can live have, for 140 days on corn, that's it. I have already told like three different family members, including my wife, about the cows in that movie. Um, the di disturbing that they're kept in confinement and eating corn just to get them bigger, yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally a Kia, I like that. Yeah. Nice one, Jade. And, and there are a lot of places where you can get your grass-fed beef, right? Um, just be wary of that because sometimes that comes with a little asterisk. Yes, it's grass fed for a certain amount of time and then it's corn fed. Uh, or grass is 80% of their diet or something and, and that's, that's not actually grass fed. Um, there are a lot of local farmers who pride themselves on having completely grass fed cattle. So. Uh, there are some, again, there, there are some farmers that only uh, sell grass-fed beef and have for the better part of the last 20 years, if not longer. Uh, but it's hard, it's hard to find and it's more expensive. And, and that's ultimately the bottom line. This is why farmers choose to have uh, corn-fed beef is because it's it's cheap because of the corn subsidies and so that's where we as a society have prioritized we prioritize cheap corn so that we can make cheap beef so that we can make cheap high fructose corn syrup so that we can have cheap calories uh, so there's there's it's it all comes down to money it all comes down to economics um, I'm going to skip asking Kurt or Ian a question um, unless you have something, but in, in my experience, very few students have a specific question for them, but feel free to post a question for Kurt or Ian and we can talk about that real quick. Um, I think this is where I want to leave off. What recommendations would you make to preserve or improve public health? 
especially given these two facts uh, about number seven, that 70% of antibiotics used in the US are consumed by livestock, and that an average steak from a feedlot raised cow, that means corn, contains as much as nine grams of saturated fat. A comparable steak from grass-fed cow might have only 1.3 grams. Check nutrition labels, yeah. 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 Um, and I think Mr. Tout might remember this too, but nutrition labels when we were growing up did not look the same as they look now. Uh, they were not standardized. Companies could put pretty much anything they wanted on a nutrition label as long as it had, uh, there were just a couple things that it had to have. Um, you didn't have the nutrition labels looking as standardized as they do now. And that is something that a lot of people do take advantage of. A lot of people do check, but yes, it's incredibly important to check that. So specifically thinking about the antibiotics and the relative amount of saturated fat, what recommendations would you make? And anything else from one through seven? If I can interrupt all the discussion for a second, and uh, <laughs> um, and throw this out there. This documentary was made in 2007. Um, a year later, the uh, Earl Butts, the guy who was interviewed, he passed. Um, he was 99 and looking pretty good for a 99 year old in that documentary. Uh, and he did not advocate actually changing any of the policy, right? He, he wanted the same policy. The same policy still exists 13 years later after this was made. Our policies have not changed. The issues haven't changed. Even though it's a 13 year old movie, these issues are still very much present today. So what do you think should change? If, if there's so much, this is, this is the time for things to change. Our food system is in a serious shock right now because of the health crisis. So what do you think, what do you think should change if it hasn't changed in 50, 60 years? I agree. Healthier options, lower income neighborhoods, often called food deserts. All right, one more. Someone lead us out. Take us home. You got this, people. Oh, great. Thank you. All right. I think that was private, but yeah, absolutely making that change in, in leadership, we'll say it that way, making sure that our, our leaders are responding to what people actually want. All right. 
everyone everyone raises their own cow yeah my stepson was talking about that yesterday i'm like we live on one sixth of an acre we don't have nearly enough land to raise a cow uh <laughs> all right have a wonderful day hopefully um hopefully the weather stays nice at least for a couple days we'll see you on friday take care of yourself stay healthy stay safe thanks for being here guys Mr. Dutton. I'm going to stay on. Um, a little bit of uh, evidence for you that I am, I am 